Hi there, friends and neighbors. I'm Carl Swenson. I'm a course mentor in diversity, inclusion, and exceptionality. We're here today to talk about uh, legal implications of special education and public law. So as we look at uh, uh, some of the, uh, the objectives for uh, our little talk today, um, these are those that we plan to uh, spend the most time with. Uh, we want to be able to recognize uh, key components of public law as they pertain to students with special needs. We want to look at uh, how um, certain laws have influenced the field of special education and will continue to do so. We want to uh, look at uh, the application of laws uh, with specific court cases. We want to uh, look how at uh, how law has um, uh, develop the way that uh, we work with English language learners. And then finally, we want to talk about uh, uh, the idea of due process and the importance of it. So as we begin, we want to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the court cases that we've seen in the past and how they've influenced us in special education. You're all well familiar with Brown v. the Board of Ed of Topeka, Kansas in 1954 truly groundbreaking and landmark legislation. It created for us the idea that uh, separate is not equal. And um, uh, in its own way, that was uh, the beginning of the groundwork for special education. Uh, in 1972, there was also a landmark case. This was uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Children, or PARC, uh, versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and what came of this was that the state must guarantee free education to kids between the ages of 6 to 21, regardless of impairment. Um, up until that time, kids were not provided with the free appropriate public education that, uh, that we've come to be familiar with. So uh, uh, Park v. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was indeed um, groundbreaking too. Um, in 1982, the uh, uh, Board of Education of Hendrick Hudson versus Rowley. Uh, it's relatively unheard of qu court case. I mean, it's not real popular, but um, it was very important because it really defined for us the, uh, uh, the concept and meaning of appropriate education. Um, appropriate doesn't mean equal. Uh, but it does mean appropriate for uh, the child um, who's in special education. Sometimes um, it's important that a child be educated in life skills as opposed to academic skills. And so this law, um, Rowley Law, uh, laid that out for us. In 1982 also, Plyler v. Doe um, was a law that uh, uh, came out of the state of Texas. The state of Texas had passed a law that uh, uh, required a fee to be paid for the immigration of, or, I'm sorry, the education of immigrant children. Um, and uh, the United States Supreme Court struck that down and said it was uh, unconstitutional to make some ch kids pay for school while other kids did not. So uh, now we've got uh, a very solidified, free, appropriate public education. Now, Daniel R.R. v. the Board of Ed in 1989 um, was, in, was instrumental in redefining the concept of least restrictive environment. Uh, we had always said, okay, kids should be in the least restrictive environment, but now Daniel R.R. v. the Board of Ed states that uh, not only does it need to be least restrictive, but also the most appropriate. We'll talk more about that in a little while. And then we're going to, uh, with Oberty versus the Board of Ed um, in Clementon School District, this requires that students be provided with necessary supports, such as uh, supplementary aids and services. Exclusion of a student requires justification and documentation. We can't just simply put a kid out of the classroom because uh, we think that he's mis may, being misbehaved. What we have to do is we have to provide documentation and justification for removal. But we also have to provide the supports uh, that are necessary. And the last law I want to talk about is most recent, and that's Winkleman uh, v. Parma School, uh, School District. And 
um, this one um, has more to do with parents than it does with, with students or schools, but this one reaffirmed the, uh, the rights of parents to represent their children in idea-related court cases. It really strengthened the idea of parental participation and uh, the idea of free appropriate public education. So now that we've had uh, a little bit of background in that, let's go and take a look at uh, legislation and you'll begin to see the tie between this legislation and uh, and the laws as we know them. So um, 1975 Congress passed a law the numerical number or the numerical name of that law was Public Law 94142. Um, there's nothing mysterious about these numbers. Um, um, the 94 uh, just identifies it as having been enacted during the 94th Congress, joint session of Congress. And uh, 142 means that it was a 142nd piece of legislation that was enacted that year, or that session. So Public Law 94-142 was also known uh, as the Education for All Handicapped Children. This was the first time, the first time, the federal government had mandated that uh, children were special even education, a public, free, appropriate public education. This is the first time that this has happened. So our field is not even 40 years old. The field of special education is not even 40 years old. So we're, we're just a fledgling, um, fledgling field in the, uh, in the idea of education. Uh, but it was the first one. That was uh, the initial law. Now, the nifty thing about um, um, laws that are enacted by Congress is that each and every one of them has an expiration date. So if the law is not a good one, it just goes away. If it is a good law, then it is most often reauthorized, and that's been the case with 94-142. Um, the first reauthorization was uh, in 1986, and that was Public Law 99-457. Uh, the <coughs> The uh, common name is 96 or the 86 amendments to Public Law 94-142. Not a very, um, not a very unique and, and interesting name, but that was the one that was given to it. Um, the Education of the Handicapped Act amendments of 1986. That was uh, uh, the uh, the moniker that we received. Uh, the law was then again reauthorized in 1990. And this was Public Law 101-476. Very important point here. Um, this is a, a turning point for us. Uh, you notice that the name of the law is now Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or the acronym IDEA. The importance of this is that if you look back at uh, 94-142, we called it the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act. The point is that we were talking about the disability before we were talking about the child. Now with the, uh, the 1990 um, reauthorization, we're talking about the child, the person first, before we talk about the, uh, the disability. And this is important to remember uh, in the annals of uh, special education. And then again in 1997, uh, we had the 97 Amendments to IDEA, or Public Law 105.17. Some major changes came about this uh, during this time period. And then the very final uh, reauthorization was in 2004. And you notice a slight change to the name here. We now call it Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. But the acronym is still IDEA, IDEA 2004. Um, and so those are um, uh, the initial law and the reauthorizations, if we have them now. Well, I want to take you back to um, uh, 94142 and explain to you what the, the six key elements or six key principles of this law were. And you can begin to see some of the correlation uh, between these six key principles and the, um, um, and the court cases that we initially uh, just very briefly talked about. These principles are free appropriate public education, least restrictive environment, an individualized education plan, 
procedural due process, non-discriminatory assessment, and parental participation. Every law that we've had since this, this initial law has included these same six key principles. When we talk about a free appropriate public education, it's just that. It's free to all children. It's public school. And it's appropriate to that student's level of learning ability. Least restrictive environment means that we want to place the child in the environment, the classroom, that is the least restrictive. When you think of um, the restriction placed on children by putting them in the classroom, obviously the general education classroom is the least restrictive environment uh, that we can put a student in. Then um, the next least restrictive would be a resource room. Uh, moving uh, towards more restrictive, then we move into a self-contained classroom. Um, think of this as an upside-down triangle with the largest part at the top and then moving down to a, a very smaller part. And as we're moving down of the, this uh, inverted triangle, we're getting into a more restrictive environment. And uh, now we move into an institutional or residential setting uh, where some of our kids with disabilities are, 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 uh, are housed and schooled. And then, and then finally, a hospital setting um, would be the most restrictive. We want to try and put the kid in the least restrictive environment. Each child who's been identified as having a disability that's covered by IDEA 2004 has the right um, and, and uh, to a, a, an individualized education plan. This is an education plan or an IEP that's prepared specifically for that, for that child. Uh, and we take into consideration things like present level of performance, what level of performance is a child at now educationally. We look at uh, long range goals. What do we want the child to be able to do at the end of a year or two years? And then we look at short range objectives, things uh, that, that uh, help us to get to those long range goals. And we include um, things like assistive technology. We include things like related services. All of those things are written into this very formal, very legal individualized education plan. Very important part of the education of a child with disabilities. Procedural due process is guaranteed to us um, by the amendments in the Constitution. Um, this means that um, we have the right to have hearings, uh, to have counsel, um, and it also gives parents and students the right to be a part of uh, this education process and special education. Non-discriminatory assessment has to do with how we're going to evaluate kids um, when we uh, when we're looking at, at the uh, the possibility of including them in special education, we want to make sure that we use assessments that are not biased. Um, we want to use assessments that uh, will not uh, uh, needlessly put a child into special education. And then finally, uh, parental participation is not encouraged; it's a right and it's a requirement. Parents are to be included in this process from the beginning to the end. So as we look at that, the next thing that we can talk about uh, that relates to um, uh, special education uh, is some civil rights legislation. And the first of those is uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Even though there are 12 different categories of disabilities listed in IDEA 2004, there is a possibility that um, a child with, with a, a disability may not fit into one of those categories. For instance, if a child is, um, has HIV AIDS, um, that isn't necessarily um, spelled out in any of those 12 categories of disability under IDEA. Section 504, though, allows us uh, to proceed and to provide certain um, uh, certain services to, uh, uh, to children who do not fall under the auspices of IDEA 2004. 
and as you're reading the slide you can see that uh, yeah no child no person can be excluded um, there are a couple of requirements um, that is that um, um, the disability must um, limit an individual in at least one or more um, areas uh, that uh, would normally be uh, uh, that would normally be considered uh, typical in life um, and uh, it, there has to be a pattern of uh, this uh, disability or limitation over a period of time and this isn't just for ages 3 to 21 like uh, like idea this uh, this actually covers the entire lifespan so um, there are some things about the 504 that are extremely similar to IDEA. For instance, we often develop a, a, a plan uh, for students. We call it a 504 plan, but it looks very, very similar to um, the uh, uh, IEP and, and IDEA. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, um, has created some things that have been very helpful for people with disabilities but they've also been very helpful for the rest of us and basically what this law says is that we can no longer discriminate um, toward people with disabilities in the way that we build things in the way that we uh, uh, in the way that we um, uh, we remodel things and I'm talking about buildings and, and such here but um, what this law does is it requires uh, anybody who's uh, making new construction or is, uh, is refurbishing a building, um, if that organization or that uh, the owners, of, I'm sorry, if that organization receives money from the federal government, then the building has to be, um, the building has to be constructed in such a way as to be in alignment with uh, the Americans for Disabilities Act. So, you know, when you walk into a building and you find that there's a, a swinging door, you know, an automatic opening door, uh, you might think, wow, this is, this is really nice, it's very convenient, but actually it's there because of the, uh, the ADA. Um, you know, the sidewalk cuts, um, we often think that they're for people who are pushing maybe berry, baby carriages or strollers, or um, maybe they're for people on bicycles or skateboarders, but actually they're there. Um, for um, persons with disabilities and we all uh, see the benefit of that. Um, maybe you've seen um, um, a new family of buses, what they, they call kneeling buses. As it comes to the bus stop um, you hear some bells and whistles and, and the bus actually um, begins to descend so that uh, it's easier to step up into the bus. These things are all a result of ADA. Uh, and uh, there's a link here. If you look down at the bottom, it says View the ADA view Video Library. You can actually watch some videos there. That's a that's a hot link, and you can hook, click on it, and uh, you can actually see some uh, uh, some videos. Now, this particular law that we're going to talk about, FERPA, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, um, really doesn't seem to have too much to do with kids with special needs, but Yes, it does. It has to do with all of us. Uh, this was a, a law passed to, uh, to ensure that um, private information remained private. The Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act um, came about <coughs> excuse me, because some uh, very confidential private information uh, was released uh, and <coughs> Congress decided to take action on that. And that was good. Um, you may remember the day when um, uh, grades were posted outside of a classroom door and they were usually posted by the student's name and that was great for the students who got A's and A pluses but for those of us that got D's and F's that wasn't so cool you know we <coughs> we uh, suffered some embarrassment because of that and there were also some some um, confidential records that were being uh, distributed and uh, this law, FERPA, puts an end to that. So, um, but it also gives parents and students access to certain records that they may not have had access to before. So that's a good thing too. So here we have um, uh, what the law does for us. Now, um, 
the students under the 18 have to uh, have parents' consent to have these these records released to them. But students over the 18 of years of age of 18, um, they can uh, sign their own permission to have those released. There are certain things we cannot do because of FERPA. Uh, for instance, we cannot divulge information regarding grades or behavior. We typically um, do not want to post uh, identifiable work on a, on a, on a bulletin board uh, if it has a grade on it. Um, we do not want to post pictures or likenesses of students without having written permission. Now many times when the school year starts, the school will uh, ask parents to sign a blanket permission statement. Um, this doesn't always work. It may have to be that we have um, permission slips for particular uh, things. And the important thing is that no information can be released from the school uh, to a private individual or to the public uh, without the parent's knowledge. Finally, we're going to talk just for a minute or two about due process. Now, as I mentioned, this is one of the key elements of um, uh, Public Law 94-142 and still is a key element of IDEA 2004. <clears throat> this establishes uh, a set of guidelines that um, we use in order to make sure that everybody's rights are protected. Um, many years ago, if a, um, if a teacher thought that a child was having difficulty in a particular classroom and maybe needed to be um, in, a, in a special education classroom or, or needed some sort of related services, uh, it was okay for that teacher just simply to ship that kid off and, and put that kid in a, uh, uh, in a special education classroom. Um, we cannot do that anymore. Now we have a very formal um, set of policies and procedures that we have to follow in order to uh, refer a child for special education. And this is the way it should be uh, because this precludes us from putting uh, children into special education who really don't need to be there. So um, we have these, these abilities now. But this also provides us with... Um, uh, a set of rights for parents as far as um, uh, seeking mediation if there's uh, a dispute between the school board or the or the school district and the, and the parents regarding uh, the education of their child it uh, also allows the parents to call for um, actually a civil hearing uh, to be um, uh, to be set and uh, to be conducted in order to um, um, to come to a conclusion in the, in the case of the child. So it's a very important part of the special education um, system as we know it today. And I think that we've probably done enough on this. I think that this gives you a good uh, general um, introduction to how the law, public law, really has influenced special education and how it continues to influence. I would, uh, I would strongly suggest that you uh, go to the course of study and you look at the, uh, the readings um, and the educational impact videos that are provided there for you that discuss a little bit more about the law. Um, very important part of your, uh, of your education. Thanks so much for your time and I hope to talk to you soon. Um, Good luck with the rest of uh, your uh, NIC1 class.